Well, good morning, everybody. Real quickly, I'd love to give the band a huge round of applause. Can we all do that? Oh. Our band is not only so talented, but they have such great hearts to serve, and I just love that about all of you guys. We are in the last week of our series called Destination Paradise, and I'm really excited about this. We've been talking about what the Bible has to say about heaven. Now, when we think about heaven, maybe you kind of think like this with me, that um, when I think about heaven, it's kind of like this, uh, that... Um, when my, when my wife and I were first preparing to get married, we didn't take a premarital counseling class. Now, uh, that probably explains a lot about our relationship, honestly. But uh, premarital counseling is important. You must take a premarital counseling class if you want to get married here at Vantage Point Church. However, we were young. We were stupid. We were in love. We didn't need no stinking premarital counseling class. But let me tell you what we did do. We did take a scuba diving class. <laughs> That's any consolation. Because that's what every great marriage is founded upon, isn't it? Uh, scuba diving. Because part of the reason why we did that is because we were going to go um, honeymooning out in Jamaica, man. And so uh, it was always a dream of mine, at least, to go scuba diving. And so we uh, honeymooned out in Jamaica. We got out on a, on, on a boat. There was a shark following our boat for part of the way, which did not make my wife very happy. Um, and then after about an hour and a half, we finally got out to the dive location. The dive master raises up the dive flag. He starts speaking a lot like Sebastian the Crab. <laughs> And he's all out like, Yama, now it's time to jump into the water. And you have to understand that our entire dive experience leading up to this moment was me and my wife swimming in a warm, heated, indoor pool in Indianapolis, Indiana. And all of a sudden, he wanted us to jump out into the ocean. Okay, so I look over at my wife. She's got her goggles and fins on, and she's like this. She's like, somebody. She's, she's like, uh-uh, uh-uh. I ain't getting into that water. Well, finally, we got up enough courage and enough strength to jump into the water. And you know what it was like? It was like, a whole new world. Don't you dare close your eyes. It was amazing. And when, when you and I think about heaven, we think about heaven kind of like that, don't we? That it's going to be a whole new world. That when we cross from this life into the next life, that it's going to be the, the, the most amazing, the most breathtaking, the most awe-inspiring experience. And today, as we end out our series on what heaven is all about, today what I want to do is I want to talk about the one thing that there is one thing that defines heaven. And today, as we talk about heaven, we want to talk about the very thing that is at the core of what heaven is all about and the very center of what heaven is all about. And you take that away and you cease to have heaven. Because could it be that maybe that we really don't have a very accurate view of what heaven is really going to be all about? If you have your Bibles, why don't you turn to Revelations chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Why don't you turn to page 1,138. <laughs> if you don't know where uh, Revelations chapter 1 is, just turn to the last page of your Bible. And today what we're going to do is we're going to read the end of this story. Why don't you all stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word this morning. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, it says this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Isn't that interesting that in heaven there's not going to be an ocean? If you're, I wrote a little thing on Facebook about it. If you want to know more about that, go on my Facebook page. Because there is not going to be an ocean in heaven. Verse 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven. So almost like those alien UFO movies where a city is descending upon the earth, is what you and I will see, and prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, look, there it is. God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will 
dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Verse 4. This is the verse that all of us are familiar with. It is only there that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, crying, pain, crime, cancer, any of those things for the old order of things has passed away. Before you sit down, would you just turn to the people around you and say good morning? Would you do that? I've been getting a lot of complaints about our high fives, so I'm going to humor you for a day. For a day. Get ready to high five next week. Okay. So, as we think about heaven, this is how we typically think about heaven. As you and I think about what it is at the core and at the the central, the central idea of heaven, this is how you and I simply define heaven. We say it like this, heaven is going to be awesome, right? If you were to come up with an idea, if somebody were to ask you, okay, come up with a description in five words or less, you would go, hey, yo, I only need one word, awesome. That's what it's going to be like. However you define awesome is the way heaven's going to be, right? That heaven's going to be a place of unlimited essential oils. (laughs) And yet you won't even need them. That heaven is going to be like eating at the Beachcomber Cafe. Anybody ever been to the Beachcomber Cafe and the Crystal Cove in Newport Beach all the time? That heaven is going to be the kind of place where you can eat all the ice cream that you want. And you don't have to worry about gaining any weight. And all God's people said, Amen. That heaven is going to be like sitting at courtside seats right next to Jack. And actually watching the Lakers win. Heaven is going to be awesome. Or maybe on a more serious note, maybe for you, maybe you don't necessarily think about how awesome heaven is going to be, but maybe for you, as you think about heaven, you think about it being at a a place where finally everything will be made right. Heaven is going to be a place where, where you no longer have to struggle with mental illness, or you no longer have to struggle with physical illness. Even as we watch the news and the world around us, that heaven is going to be no longer a place where we have to worry about things like racial reconciliation and, and cops being innocently targeted by other people. And, and, and it seems like our country is fighting for its own identity right now. And you, maybe you're in law enforcement right now. You know, let me tell you, I know a ton of you law enforcement people, you go out every day and you're so brave and courageous and you want to go out. If you're a Christian, you want to go out and you want to do the right thing. But maybe you're not that person. Maybe you're the spouse of that law enforcement officer. And every single day you wonder if your spouse is going to come home okay. And the crazy thing is this, that the Bible gives us absolutely no promise at all that things are going to get any better. In fact, the only promise of the Bible is that things are only going to get worse. And maybe for you, the only hope that you hold on to is the fact that one day, one day, that one day, that God is going to make everything right. Can I tell you this? If those things are the only thing that you see heaven to be, and if those things that I just mentioned are the only things that define heaven for you, then I have come here to tell you that you have pictured hell more than you've actually pictured heaven. And you might say to me, well, Mark, what are you talking about? Because, I mean, it says it right there in verse 4. Verse 4 says it right there. That he, speaking of God, that he will wipe every tear from their eyes. That there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. There it is right there. That is what heaven is going to be like. And in fact... Here's the problem that you and I always focus on verse 4, where verse 4 is only the byproduct and the residuals of what heaven is all about. That in fact, you and I, what we do is we pass verse 3 in order to focus on verse 4 when verse 3 defines for us 
At the core, what heaven is all about. And what is that? Why don't you look verse 3. It says this. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will now dwell with them. That we will now be roommates with God. In Genesis chapter 1, what does it say? That they walked with God. That they talked with God. And that now that you and I will be roommates with God, we will be able to say, hey God, the refrigerator's empty. Hey God, what are you doing for dinner tonight? We will now have that kind of, that they will be his people. And that God himself will be with them and be their God. Here is the simplest definition of heaven that you could come up with right here. That in heaven, we will see the face of God. That is what heaven is all about. You and I will come to see God face to face. And if that isn't the sole thing that you are waiting for, if that in and of itself does not define your heavenly experience, then I'm here to tell you that you have got heaven and hell confused. You know what people... What Bible scholars call this one idea to see the face of God, they call this the beatific vision. The beatific vision, if you were to translate that or from Latin, it would mean the happy sight. You know what the happy sight is? Well, well maybe you know what the happy dance is. You know what the happy dance is? The happy sight is the very thing that makes you want to do the happy dance. Know, that, know the happy dance? If you don't know the happy dance, then it's probably because you've never met one of our most amazing staff members, Christy Natividad, who has perfected the happy... Christy, would you stand up and would you do the happy dance for us? Okay, 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 this is the... Let's give it up for Christy Natividad, everybody. The happy dance. Maybe your happy dance goes something like this. Maybe your happy dance goes something like this. I don't know what your happy dance looks like, but the happy sight is nothing more than the very thing that makes you want to do the happy dance. Okay? And as a Christian, what the Bible is saying is that there is nothing in the world that would make you want to, that, 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 that would be a happier sight that would make you want to do a happier dance than to see the face of God. That is the very thing that you and I as Christians, as two lovers come together, that is the very thing that we have been longing and waiting for all of our lives. It's, it's, it's almost kind of like this. Um, I don't know if you know this, maybe some of you know this, but one time I was working at a local conference and at this local conference, I was working a booth, and uh, one of my favorite pastors was going to be there. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. His name is Andy Stanley. Andy Stanley is one of my favorite pastors. Monique is laughing because she knows that to be the case. Um, and Andy Stanley, one time I was just standing at my booth, just kind of doing my thing, when all of a sudden I see Andy Stanley kind of walking by the courtyard. I'm like, hey, I want to go meet Andy Stanley face to face. I mean, I've seen videos of him all the time. I've watched him all the way from California where he's in Georgia. I want to go meet Andy Stanley face to face. And as I'm walking over there, I'm like this. Okay, play it cool, Mark. Play it cool. You know, don't act like some crazy old, like, starstruck Christian. He's a normal person. He puts his pants on one leg at a time. So I walk over to Andy Stanley, and I'm like, hey, 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 Andy, right? Hey, uh, Andy, just want you to know that uh, I appreciate your ministry and I watch you all the way from California, and you've had a real big impact on me as a pastor. And he says, Mark Lee, right? How are things going at Vantage Point? 
And I was like, And he's like, okay, I got another session coming up in a little bit. I'll talk to you a little bit later. So I go back to the booth. I go back to the booth, and I'm like, <gasps> I met Andy Stanley, and he knows my name. And the guy said, um, could it be because you're wearing a name tag? He knows me. <laughs> I want you to think about the one person that you would love to meet in this life. Maybe it would be Andy Stanley. Maybe for you it would be LeBron, LeBron James as a you know, famous athlete. Maybe it would be, I don't, I don't know, I'm just going to name people Bruno Mars because he's such a, a great dancer and he can do a happy dance much better than I can. Or maybe for you, you would love to meet a great leader like Abraham Lincoln or a CEO of some famous company or whatever the case may be. I want you to think about today the person that you would love to meet in this life. And here's what I'm here to tell you, that God is the one who created that person. That God is the one who created any idol, any, and we, any person that you admire. That God is the one who created them with the intellect that they have. With the communication and the vision casting ability that they might have. With the, with the, with the athletic ability and the creativity that that person has. That God is the one who created that person. So for you and I to meet God face to face would be just the most amazing experience that we could ever have. But here's the problem, here's the problem. Here's what every good Jew knew. That no one could see the face of God and live. In fact, Moses had an experience with God where he said, God, I really want to really see your glory. And you know what God says? God says this. You want to see my glory? You can't, hand you want to say it with me? You <laughs> Say it with me, say it with me. You can't handle my glory. And then he says this in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. He says this, but he said, You cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And think about this, think about this. For you and I to be in the unfiltered, for you and I to be in the undiluted presence of God, for you and I to see God face to face, well, you have to understand that that was not only to be feared because you could lose your life, but that was to be favored. To see God face to face, that was to know God. That was to be in relationship with God. It's not only that we are friends, but that we are lovers now. It is no, no longer that we are writing prayer emails from afar, but now that we are roommates, that we live under the same roof, that we were lovers. Yeah, I, I, I remember I used to tell Andrea this all the time while we were engaged, I, I, you know, because we'd always part ways at the end of the night. I'd say, Andrea, I can't, I can't wait for the day where one day you and I are married so that you can be the first face that I see every morning. And after 17 years of marriage, I still kind of mean that. <laughs> there's a, there's a best-selling book out. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's called Five People That You Meet in Heaven. Have you ever heard of it? Five people that you meet in heaven. It talks about a man who felt lonely and unimportant in this life. He goes to heaven. He dies. He ends up meeting five people who tell him that his life really, really mattered. And so he meets one person that he reconciles his relationship with. He meets another person that he finds forgiveness with. 
He meets another person that tells him that his life really mattered and that he's really important. And as great as an, and as entertaining as that story is, part of the problem is that it misses the very idea of what heaven is all about. Because here is the idea that you and I need to understand about heaven. That heaven is not about me. That heaven is not about my dreams, my desires, my unaccomplished goals in this life that will hopefully be remedied in the next. That heaven is not about me. That heaven is all about Jesus. That it's all about God. And if you have not already learned to prioritize God's presence in your life, if you have not already learned to prioritize time with God's people, and if you do not love to sacrifice for God's purposes, then I'm afraid that you're not really going to like heaven. Because heaven is all about him. Going to heaven without Jesus is like going on your honeymoon and saying, where's my husband? Go heaven without God is a, is a kingdom without a king. I think Samuel Rutherford put it best when he says this right here. Brilliant quote on heaven. He says this, Oh my Lord Jesus Christ, if I could be in heaven without thee, it would be a hell. But, if I could be in hell and have thee still, it would be a heaven to me, for thou art all the heaven that I need. You want to know what defines a Christian? What defines a Christian is not how much or how little we've sinned. What defines a Christian is not how I've checked a box or walked down an aisle, gone onto a field, whatever the case may be. Whatever, what defines a Christian, not how we gain our salvation, but a symptom of, a result of our salvation. What you will find is that a genuine Christian will answer this question, well, this question right here. That if you are going to go to hell, but you could be there with God, would you still choose to go there? In other words, that if you could be with God, but you knew that cancer and chemotherapy must come with him. If you could be with God and you knew that you and your children must be homeless in the process, if you could be with God but divorce and depression marked your existence, would you still choose to follow him anyways? Because if heaven is an amusement park, guess what? It's only got one attraction. And that only attraction is God. But guess what? That's okay. You know why? Because God is my only reward. Before we go out on a date, sometimes Andrea would tell me, I'll say, honey, where you want, where, where you want to go eat tonight? And she'll say, I don't care as long as I'm going with you. Yeah, and I go, aw, that makes me feel good. It makes me think that she loves me more than the awesome blossom that she's about to eat. <laughs> and I, I honestly think that it's manipulation on her part because I always end up taking her someplace better. <laughs> but that's what it means to be in relationship. That's what it means to be in love. You want to spend time with that person. You want to be with that person. See, if you are a genuine Christian, 
Because about, and I use that term because the Bible talks about false Christians all the time. If you are a genuine Christian, you know what? You find your questions you find yourself asking. You find yourself asking questions like this one right here. What books of the Bible have you been binge reading recently? That's what you will ask yourself. Not, not like, hey, what you been binge watching on Netflix recently? No, 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 no. No, real quick Christians ask questions like, what books of the Bible have you been binge reading recently? You know what Christians will ask? They will ask, why are you always binge praying? Would you get up off the ground and do something? You, all you ever do is talk to God. All you ever do is you're on the phone all the time. You're texting God all the time. <laughs> Would you stop that? Genuine Christians. You know what you have to say of genuine Christians? Get out of here. Church is over. Service is done. Go home. No, you can't come back on Monday. You know, because what's said of the early church? What? They met together in the temple courts every single day. You know, that is what we should be saying because that's what it means to be in love. That's what it means to be in relationship. Can't wait to see the other person. You can't wait to spend eternity together with the other person. I don't, I don't know about you, but um, all of a sudden, like, I feel convicted by this message, and it reminds me of my favorite line from my favorite hymn. And if you feel convicted by, if you feel like this line uh, um, represents you in your heart, I, I want to ask you to kind of raise your hand because it definitely represents me. Favorite line from my favorite hymn is this, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God that I love. If that's you, would you raise your hand today? That's me. That's me. See, the rest of y'all, you have it all together, don't you? you? You pray without ceasing. You give above the tithe. Y'all good. But for the rest of us, that's how we feel. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God that I love. I have an application for you this week, a homework assignment this week for you. And if that's you today, and if I just described your heart, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. For the next 30 days, we're not going to have any wimpy seven-day challenge. For the next 30 days between now and August 22nd, that you would binge read your Bible. Whatever that looks like for you, I'm not going to say one chapter. Uh, some, I could say five chapters a day, and some of y'all would be like, there's no way I could do that. Some of you would be like, that is the easiest thing in the world. So I'm going to ask you, for those of you who want to accept this challenge, that for the next 30 days that you would find yourself in the presence of God, that you would binge read your Bible. Do you know why? Because that's what heaven is going to be like. And if you don't like that, then guess what? Odds are you're not going to like heaven very much. And do you know why we do that? We do that for two different reasons. We do that because, yes, as a result of my love for God, but we do that too because sometimes when you work out, you realize just how out of shape y'all you are. You want to do something in order to help you get stronger. You're going to find yourself kind of in that same situation. So here's how I'm going to ask you to respond to that challenge. If you want to say, yep, for the next 30 days between today, starting today, until August 22nd, I'm going to binge read my Bible. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm just going to ask you to grab your connection card and write on there, I accept. That's it. This week, I'm going to be getting all the connection cards. I'm going to be praying for you by name. So if you want to accept that challenge, I'm going to ask you to get out your connection cards. I'm going to ask you to stick that down. For some of you who aren't Christians today, um, or for maybe some of you who have thought, you know what, Mark? Um, <clears throat> maybe I thought I was a Christian. I kind of grew up in the church. But, you know, I don't know if I really have this relationship that you're talking about. Like, I have religion... I do the things, I go through the motions, but I don't really know if I have this relationship that you're talking about. But you know what? If that's what it's all about, and if it's not just about do's and don'ts, well then, I want that relationship. The, per the simplest way that I can put that relationship is something like this. Some of you guys know this, but my wife and I, we just traveled to South Korea last week because we're in the process of adopting a child. And so we got to see that child for the first time. You guys want to see a picture? You guys want to see a picture? 
You guys want to see a picture? There he is right there! He's so cute! Ah! We're going to give him the American name Judah, but his Korean name is Kaun. Kauni! Kauna! Ilova! Inuma! I may have even swore, I'm not too sure. That's just what my parents say all the time. So if you understand Korean, you'll have to excuse me. But that's, that's, that's the little child that we're about to adopt. We've, we've known that for the past year and a half. We've been in this process. But let me tell you this, for that child up there, just one life out of many, one orphan out of many in this world, my wife and I, we traveled a great distance to visit that child. In fact, we went halfway around the world, sitting our butts in coach on Asiana Airlines for 13 hours while our butts absolutely burned. That was just one way. We traveled halfway around the world for this child. We paid a great price for this child. We paid a lot of money for him. And so the moment I walked into that room, you know the first thing I said to him was? I said this, you owe me. <laughs> no, the first thing that I said when I, when I walked into that room was, uh, I didn't even know if I could pick him up. Isn't that weird that a child would be yours, but you didn't even know if you could pick him up? But after a while, I picked him up. And I said, Kana, I chose you. I didn't have that choice with the rest of my children. <laughs> God made me take them. But you, I chose you. So at any time you're ready, and any time you want, you can go ahead and you can call me daddy. And this is what I, I'm hoping that you're clapping at. Because this illustration absolutely pales into com in comparison to what your heavenly father has done for you. Your heavenly father traveled a greater distance, giving up a throne in heaven and even being, you know, becoming flesh incarnate. He paid a much greater price than the amount of money that we paid. In fact, he gave his life on a cross so that he could tell you, you know what? From the very beginning of time, I chose you. And any time you're ready, maybe that time is right now. You can call me daddy. And if you want to do that today, I want to encourage you to do that. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. On your connection card is a little box that says, I made a decision to follow Christ today. Would you mark that box? And here's what I'm asking you to do today. I'm asking you to tear that off asking you to find me under the, ten, the gray easy ups called connection point. And I just want to be able to say congratulations. That's it. Thanks for being here, everybody. Why don't you bow your heads and pray with me?